We'll get started. All right, thanks everyone and welcome to tonight's event, a YANA Town Hall. For those of you that aren't familiar with YANA, it stands for the Yale Alumni Nonprofit Alliance. My name is Ken Inadomi, class of 76, uh, proud to be the YANA chair. And uh, it's hard to believe that we're really going into our 10th year as an organization. And it's also uh, kind of gratifying to realize that our mission really hasn't deviated since the beginning. You know, we, our, the YANA mission is to convene and to connect the Yale alumni social impact nonprofit community and to try to leverage the power of that community for the greater good. For those of you that are new to YANA and if you'd like to learn more about it and, and join the movement, as we say, please let me know or let Rachel know who I'm going to introduce in just a minute. So tonight's program, we have uh, several social impact leaders. They're all social entrepreneurs. They represent different fields, including the arts, education, leadership development, community development. They're all going to speak for about eight minutes, and then we're going to be anchored by Jeannie Blaustein, who's our spotlight presenter, and Jeannie's going to speak for about 15 minutes. Um, so our first speaker, uh, Rachel Littman, the you know, class of 91, she's been our executive director for the past year and a half, and under her leadership, Yana really has achieved even greater heights. Uh, in just in terms of programming, impact, governance, fundraising. So to tell you what's happening now in Yana land, here's Rachel. Hi everyone, welcome. Thank you for joining. Um, just so you know, those who are joining us, we are recording this. So um, if you're um, not sitting quite in front of your computer, you might wanna make sure your video is off. Uh, thank you. We are, as Ken said, in, in our 10th year. This is my uh, second year as executive director and I was involved in the board and uh, the New England chapter before that. I'm now down in Houston, Texas. And we've got a chapter growing down here. I uh, just want to give people a quick update. Uh, if you haven't been to our website recently, please go there. We're really trying to make that the, the other than our communications uh, and we don't want to bombard people too much. We have all of our webinars and programming, our virtual town halls, announcements, um, opportunities uh, for volunteering are all there on our website. Uh, I just want to bring a couple of matters to your attention. Our, our 2019 annual report was posted online and uh, Ken and I and we had uh, been sitting in our various places across the country from each other, filling out notes to, uh, to get the hard copies out for the first time we've ever done it. So if you were a donor in 2019, you will have gotten, I uh, hope it will get soon, a hard copy. So. Thank you, and that's a motivation for to join YANA, is that you get to not only be recognized in the annual report, but you'll get a hard copy as well. Um, but you can check out that one and see all the great stuff and the social impact stories uh, we've been telling. Um, our webinars, remember, uh, not only our virtual town halls, but our webinars we were already doing for probably 16 months before the COVID pro, uh, pandemic hit. Uh, so glad to say we were really at the forefront. So we've been set up and in high demand and increased our capacity. So now we're doing these kinds of online programs um, every two weeks, if not every week. This is probably the second or third one I've done today for YANA alone. I was on a YANA Chicago call earlier. Um, so we have, so we're really supporting our chapters and our communities all over the place. And we're glad to be able to provide that platform uh, for them. And uh, all of our programs for the most part are recorded or edited and cleaned up and on our YouTube channel, uh, they're archived there so you can go back and if you forget or you want to know what we have on our uh, videos page, I believe it is on our website, we've categorized everything. So if you're interested in refresher in fundraising or marketing, communication, social innovation, uh, you can kind of go back to our website and then they'll have a quick description and then it'll link you to the YouTube channel uh, if you ever need that as a resource. Um, I also wanted to, uh, if you haven't seen already, we've announced our three summer fellows uh, that we partner with Yana Dwight Hall. This is our fourth summer, and can correct me if I'm wrong, here's our fourth summer. Um, I can tell you that one of the one of the individuals from our first cohort just graduated from Yale. He was on the this uh, New York City chapter panel last month. Uh, he's got a Rhodes Scholarship. He's doing some work this summer. Um, I think he had just turned out he's doing something with the Yale Law School, one of their clinics, I think, um, remotely. But uh, he's a Rhodes Scholar, so that's really just tremendous to be in partnership and really help some of these students get started. So our most recent cohort it was the first time we did a video um, announcing them and they each get to say a few minutes. So if you haven't seen that, it's on our homepage. Again, thank you uh, to our donors who've supported that. We still need a little bit more money, like another thousand or so. So if you haven't supported 
the fellowship or YAMI yet this year, please do so. You can go right to our homepage. There's a button that says support or donate. Um, and when you go into Network for Good, there's an option to support that. Uh, it means a tremendous amount. It allows students who are on financial aid to pursue um, unpaid internships in the social impact space. It's, these people are amazing. They hardly need our oversight. They're running their own projects for the most part, but they do need our financial and networking support. So thank you for supporting that. And please learn about that. And I believe Grace Jin, who's one of our fellows, is going to be on the call this evening. So you'll hear from her. Um, and then for the first time, we actually have our own interns. Uh, one of the projects we've been doing, and since we're in this space, a couple, um, a group of Yale students and recent grads, um, one of our fellows from last summer, Trin, who's actually out in Cambodia uh, doing her postgraduate work, is had partnered up with some other students, and they created a website called uh, generationdoit.org. We highlighted them in our newsletter, and they sort of leapt in uh, to help combat the um, issue with students and recent graduates whose internships have been canceled um, and they really want to be doing work. So they surveyed about 1,500, 2,500 people through their own network that they could get at Yale. Um, got about, I think, 500 or 700 responses and about 75, 80% of them were all interested in social impact. So they um, set up a logarithm and forms and they came to Yana and said, can you help us figure out what's the best way to solicit nonprofits? So we've been helping them um, and they've been doing some matching. And I can tell you, I interviewed three people. We've got two interns starting already working with us. And um, one of, they're either covered by DSA, which is the um, domestic service award that the Dean's office at Yale came up with, um, or they've got other sources of funding because so that just opens it up. We would just please let every nonprofit out there, if you've got a project and you want access to some students who really want to help, that's one platform to do it. Um, also, if you haven't joined Cross Campus yet, that's another platform you can get in touch. Uh, First Gen Yale also is working to bring students uh, to alumni. So there's lots of ways you can get involved if you either have work or want to support students or support nonprofits. Uh, you can find all this information on our website. So without further ado, thank you for all of your support. Stay tuned. Uh, and keep joining our webinars. So I will sign off now and Ken, let me know. And I'll also be monitoring during any of the speaking sessions if anybody has Q&A. Um, I don't, I should have both the Q&A and the um, raise your hand talk function. Uh, and I will try to monitor those though so Ken can manage the agenda. Great, Rachel, thank you. Okay, so our first speaker is gonna be Ethan Hurd. And keep in mind that the theme for tonight is the uplifting, the inspirational, the creative things that are going on in social impact. You know, this crisis has been such a downer in so many ways, but on the opposite side, there's all those positive forces that are emerging and you're gonna hear a lot of them tonight. Ethan Hurd is the founder of Heartbeat Opera. He has another engagement tonight, so we put him at the top of the bill. He's got an incredible story to tell and how He's on how they've used virtuality to still convey the arts in a compelling way. Ethan? Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me, Ken. Uh, yes, I'm the founding co-artistic director of Heartbeat Opera in New York City. We were founded um, by four Yaleys, and we're actually in the midst of a run of our Lady M, which is our adaptation of Verdi's Macbeth. And we were going to be doing in-person performances in Brooklyn, May 11th through 16th. But uh, in March, we found out we needed to pivot and take our rehearsals and our performances online. So we very rapidly conceived of a new approach. We uh, did a 10-day remote residency with six singers and six instrumentalists. We rehearsed on Zoom for two hours a day and then sent folks off with recording and video composition assignments. And um, we were really, we're really happy with, with how it turned out. Um, Anne, am I right that you came to see? Yes, Anne came to see one. Um, so we decided at first to, to offer 12 virtual soirees on Zoom. We would have two live performers uh, at each soiree. We'd show a behind the scenes documentary video and a music video of Lady M's iconic sleepwalking scene. And they really went so well that we extended to 18 soirees and now we extended to 32. So I have one tonight. I had a matinee this afternoon. We had folks zooming in from all over the world. We're really excited. We have a map going um, with everyone who's zooming in. 
And actually, I'd like to show it to you, if I may. It, yep, give it a try. I just allowed participants. Beautiful. So this is our website, heartbeatopera.org. I hope you'll come check us out sometime. And this is our maps to give you a sense of um, where folks have been joining us from, which is really exciting. So we're aiming for um, getting some Asian friends and African friends to join us. We have our first Australian friend joining, I believe, tonight. Um, so I thought I would just give you all a short, short taste of what we were able to create. Um, so I have this video to share, and um, let me just go back out for a moment. So we, believe it or not, created this whole video in quarantine. So the six singers recorded their audio separately. They watched the conductor, Jacob, um, conduct in a video. And then they listened to the piano track in a, in a headset. Um, and we, our sound engineer, also a Yaley, wove all the uh, recordings together. And then our choreographer uh, made this piece, which I'll just share with you now. It's a little two minute clip. Let's see. I definitely feel like the singers are surprising me. The actual process is just leading us. And so there's a kind of open heartedness that I need to bring. I think we all are bringing and a flexibility and a joy and a love that is very like profound and refreshing. I definitely went into this process unsure of how much this would resemble opera as we know it. And the truth that has come out of it for me is that opera has always been uh, defined more by just the fact that it is the combination of every artistic endeavor. And it's the thing that combines the most number of different disciplines from sets and costumes and design to direction and movement and singing and playing. And, and here we are on Zoom now pushing ourselves to use every possible thing that this technology affords us to make a piece of art. And in that way, that combination of disciplines makes it absolutely, not, it couldn't be anything but opera. So that's a little taste, <laughs> um, and I hope you'll you'll check us check out our work in the future. We have um, soirees through June sixth. We have a few tickets left, and we do anticipate being online for a while. So we'll probably be making more of these shows and videos uh, in the future. Um, Ken, is there anything else you'd like me to talk about? Uh, no, but Ethan, that was incredibly inspiring, and the fact that you were able to do that during the crisis in seclusion is just remarkable. So hat, hat tip to you. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be with you all. Okay, thank you for joining us. Uh, our next speaker is Aaron Chip. Aaron has a remarkable, has been just a remarkable alum. He was one of the first alums I met when I first became an, an at that time an AYA delegate, I think back in 08. He's been, um, he's the founder of Why Apply, which is a, again, a, 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 a remarkable nonprofit that is looking at fighting inequality to make sure that there's equal access to college opportunities among all students. Aaron, it's all yours. Great. Thank you so much, Ken. Um, and thank you all for having me here. I'm really glad to come today and speak a little bit about um, Why Apply and where we are in terms of uh, COVID-19. Can I agree with you? I think that, that it's a dark time in the world, and I think that's just the way it is. But I also think that um, in that, there's room for lots of opportunity, 
investment possibility. So what I like to do first, I like to talk a little about why apply for those on the call who may not know um, anything about it, our mission, our history, and the work that we do, and then talk about um, kind of where we are now and what our um, next steps are forward for, for the foreseeable future. So as Ken said, um, I am the founder and CEO of Why Apply, and like Ethan, Why Apply was also founded by four Yale alumni in the fall of 2007. Um, the four of us had been involved in college admissions in some way, shape, or form um, to that point, and we had noticed that we were not seeing um, candidates um, from non-traditional places apply to top tier schools. Um, so we want to do something about it. So uh, kind of in tandem with this um, initiative from the former AYA, then AYA director, Mark Dahlhoff, to get um, Yaleys to be of service, global service, Wireply was born. Um, and we partnered with the Office of Undergraduate Admissions, um, the former dean, then Dean Jeff Brunzel, to create the programming and think about it. And that first program was held in New York City in 2008. Um, and here we are in 2020, still going strong. We have had about 600 students and families come through our program in seven cities across the country, New York, Newark, Los Angeles, Chicago, Boston, Atlanta, DC, and probably one that I'm forgetting. So the nature of our work, basically our mission is that we help um, high achieving public school students from diverse backgrounds and their families with financial aid options and the application process to top tier colleges and universities. How we define top tier colleges and universities are four year private or public accredited American institutions in which the acceptance rate is 30% or lower of their incoming freshman class. And we very much focus on, again, students who come from under-resourced background, underprivileged backgrounds, um, working class, poor, um, non-white students who traditionally you don't see um, at predominantly white institutions like Yale. I'm happy to report that um, over our 12, 13 years that we've been in existence, we have had students um, be accepted to and attend and graduate from all the top colleges and universities in the country. So, um, what makes our work different from other nonprofits that are operating in this space of college access is that we deliver our programming in person. Um, we actually take our team and we travel to the cities and we deliver these in-person programmings where we help the students understand what makes a strong um, essay, interview, how you put together your common app, how you put together your college list. Um, financial aid, the CSS profile, FAFSA, um, building a budget while you're in college, all of these things. Well, the in-person part ain't happening this year. Um, that's not happening because I, I personally, um, and we as the board feel, it's just not worth putting our people in jeopardy to go teach when places in the United States are having different response rates um, to COVID-19. It just doesn't make sense to do that because with an academic calendar, you know, it comes like clockwork, you know, a common app goes live in August, you know, decision day is May 1st. That's pretty much our season as it is. And, and we just know that we're not going to have, that the time is not going to be there for us to, to really do that in the way that we have. The second reason that we're not doing in person this year is we, no, um, and, and part of my other work, um, I work as a college admissions consultant, have my own practice called the Ivy Edge. Um, so it's part of my job to pay attention to these things. Um, we don't believe that the schools will have together in time um, to be able to work with us to come deliver in person because it takes months for the logistics to be worked out. And um, these schools are the high schools that we go to, the places where we, where we deliver the programming are a little bit occupied right now. Um, so what that has bought us at Why Apply um, is something that is invaluable, I feel, is time. Um, time to really think and plan about what our next steps is. So um, I, I, like Rachel said earlier, we've been a little bit ahead of the curve in the fact that this year was the first time that we decided to deliver a piece of our programming digitally. Particularly what we did was we took and we took our information around the financial aid piece because our parents were really wanting more 
um, robust information from us as an organization. So we decided to do that and deliver it to them um, by doing a 90 minute webinar um, on all things financial aid. And it was very successful. So, the, the, and being the nerds that we are with every in-person um, program we do, webinar, whatever it is, we're always nerds. We do surveys, get feedback, see how people liked it. People did like it and still thought the information was valuable. So what we are looking at right now, which I think is the big opportunity for why I apply, um, is to take the entire program and make it be digital, um, have it be online. Um, we're not, in, we're in the process of, of transforming that material from being in person to digital, seeing what stays, seeing what needs to go, and seeing what needs to change. So since we're now at the um, end part of May, and we've crossed Memorial Day, um, and we, we don't really have to start thinking about delivering any of this until you know mid-September, early October, we have the value of the summer really developing it. The great thing about it is because it's all kind of on PowerPoint, it's, you know, it's kind of digital anyway, we just kind of go in person and deliver it you know, to big screen. We have the raw material there. We don't think that it's going to take a lot of time to, to transform into a digital platform. Um, we do think we will lose some things in terms of the fact that what we feel made our program successful is that it was run by people who we say are virtual alumni of Why Apply. I am a first generation student. I came from work class background. And so are the people who are, who we choose to be the presenters and facilitators in the room. So there's a real authenticity there that you can't really mess with. Um, and there's a connection and there's a belief and there's a trust. Once we get the students and families in the room that we're not, you know, some left coast, west coast, east coast elitist coming in saying that we know what's best for you and here's how you do it, uh, which I think sometimes nonprofits suffer from um, that, that savior complex. Um, so we have, we have to figure out how to take a unique part of our programming that we know differentiates us from others in this space and, and translate that to an online experience. We don't have, we don't know what that looks like yet because we've never done it before for a full class soup to nuts. So this year is going to be really fantastic because we're going to find out what that's going to be. We're going to find out if, if the level of engagement is the same. We're going to find out if the information is, is, is still going to be relevant. Um, also, particularly for this year, which I'm personally really excited about, um, as you all I'm sure can hear the animation um, in my voice um, as I speak, is that it's all up in the air for higher education. You know, it, uh, it's up in the air for Yale, it's up in the air for all of them. Are they going to be online? Are they going to have a reduced semester? Um, are they going to not come back um, all year? So what does that mean for the graduating class of 2021? Um, you know, it used to be um, that these top schools were looking particularly hard for, for our students because they really were making attempts, some better than others, and really moving towards being a real meritocracy and really trying to get the best and brightest minds on planet Earth. Um, but, you know, at college star business, you know, they have to pay their bills. Um, and I do not know what is going on with these endowments of these schools and if they are going to be able to have the resources to be able to provide the level of, of financial aid that we do see a Yale providing where a student, you know, if a family makes under sixty-five or sixty thousand dollars, like you know, it's all grant money. We don't know, and we know that those students are making the decisions. So we don't know if they're if these colleges this year will focus on our students in the way they have in the past ten or twelve years, which is a very real thing. Um, sad and true, but it is because they may not have planned, you know, in their capital campaigns for this. Um, and they may go towards families that can pay and go back to, you know, having these institutions be for people that are wealthy and privileged um, and have access and resources. So that's going to be really interesting for us to see as an organization as well, um, how that falls out. In some ways, that makes the need of what we do greater than ever 
because one thing that COVID-19 has really revealed is just how big the equities are. Where I used to think there they were cracks, I now see that they're chasms, and it's really um, unfortunate. Um, but again, you know, opportunity, because I, I do think there's a lot of um, belief in this work still. Um, I hope that those decision makers um, will still believe in the possibility of these students to still believe in um, really trying to find the best and brightest minds to do this work that we need to do, because God knows um, we need the best and brightest minds on this. We're going to be in this for a while, and we need to put the best and brightest minds on planet Earth, as young as they are, um, in the pipeline to be at the at the best institution so they can get the best education and training and be connected with other big bright minds in the world to to work on these things um, so it's a really interesting time for us at wirefly it's 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 it's, it's an interesting time in the world um, and we're going to see we're going we're going to see um how this works we also knew knew that we're also doing this year planning on doing this year traditionally we had just reached out directly to the students and the families and invited them to our program. Um, before COVID-19 hit, we thought about and planned to go to a different model, a hybrid model, which we'd still have our bed and, bed and, bed, bread and butter programming, but think about how we can also use this as an opportunity to generate revenue by um, putting together different parts of our programming to different um, organizations, high school organizations. We were in conversation with um, Harlem Children's Zone, which I understand somebody is speaking from Harlem Children's Zone on this town hall. So um, maybe we can talk. Um, and some other organizations um, to see if we could license our product out to them for their use. Those conversations came to a screeching halt because um, they just had more important things to do. And so did we. So we're not going to put that model to a side. Um, but what we are looking at is um, identifying the top public schools in the urban metro areas where we currently operate. Now there are only four of them, Atlanta, Boston, DC, and Chicago. Reaching out directly to those administrators because we, we do have those schools, we do have those veins, um, and work with them directly, which is also gonna be new for us. Um, so instead of going to the students and families, um, working with the administrators and the guidance counselors um, at the schools um, to identify the kids, um, in, in, introduce them to the programming, um, and, and even kind of, you know, introduce the administrators digitally to what we're doing by having a Why Apply Town Hall, something similar to this, where they get to learn about us, ask us questions, kick the tires, you know, see that we're the real deal, see that we have students who've come from their high schools that have now come to our program and graduated and they've gone on. So this is some of the work that we have ahead of us. Um, I am excited about it. It's daunting. Um, it, 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 it makes me want to sometimes just stay in bed and eat haagen ice cream <laughs> for the weekend. Um, but I'm really excited about um, the work. Um, like I said, I feel like the need for, for at least our mission um, is greater than it ever has been. Um, how we're going to move forward and tackle it and solve it, um, we will see. So everyone, stay tuned. And I'm happy to answer any questions that anyone has about why I applied the work we do and what we're thinking about. Great, Aaron, thank you. And by the way, uh, we'll make sure that you're able to be in touch with all of the speakers tonight. If you need it, just contact Rachel and me. We'll make sure that you get connected. Okay, I should have also mentioned that Aaron is on the current YAA Board of Governors. He's, he's, he's constantly serving and giving back. So Aaron, thank you so much. You are welcome, Ken. You are welcome. Most welcome. Okay, next speaker, speaking about students, uh, David McCulloch wasn't so long ago that he was a student. He was class of 2017, and he started, a um, again, looking at this whole gap of leadership, leadership development, and he started an organization called American exchange project. David. Well, thank you, Ken, and uh, thank you for everyone, everyone for having me and uh, to give you a sense of how young I am. Uh, hello, Barbara Monk, and I need to thank her right now for keeping me out of trouble for four years in Davenport College. Um, I'm a member of the class of 2017. Uh, as Ken mentioned, I've started a, a brand new nonprofit called the American Exchange Project, um, and in short, what we're doing 
is taking the idea of a foreign exchange program, a study abroad, and applying it to towns and cities of different demographics in the United States. In other words, if you're a kid today or a high school junior or senior growing up in the suburbs of New York, through our program you can meet, interact with, hang out with, and then go live in uh, a town in say rural Arkansas or Kansas and get to know what life is like in a community totally different from the one you've grown up in. And we think, at least in the beginning of the day, our hope was that this would work against some of the, the, some of the factors of division in our society today, political polarization, economic inequality, social isolation. Um, that idea, uh, like Why Apply and the Heartbeat Opera, our idea was hatched by four Yaleys over lunch at Maury's. Uh, we had one Harvard guy at the table, but he didn't talk very much. So we'll, we'll leave that for, for later. Um, and the hope there was all of us at, uh, at that lunch had had an experience making friends with people who were totally different from the people we lived with. And we'd seen in those friendships and those relationships the sort of solution, although it was hard to define what it was as, as you know, big ideas are in the beginning, the sort of solution to all the problems we saw um, coming to life in, in our democracy. That was in January of 2019. Uh, fast forward to November of the same year. We've taken this idea of kind of a friend-making program out onto the road. We've realized that what we need to do is structure it around this idea of exchange of, as I tell our students, study abroad in your own country. We've also seen that such a program like that had a lot of logistical complications, not so many that it wasn't worth doing, but enough that we wanted to create some other method to scale our organization. So what we came up with was uh, re truthfully exactly what we're doing now, group online hangouts with high school kids from all over the country. Um, we get together, we started on Google Hangouts, we're now on Zoom, and we just spend an hour together. I would act much like a teacher. I'd been a teacher briefly before this, I started this program. Um, and my lessons were not about history or literature. They were about kids getting to know each other. Um, and we had a, a small cohort of students from what we felt were kind of the two opposite parts of our country. We had um, affluent liberal suburbs of Boston, and conservative working class towns in Southwest Louisiana and East Texas. We had a small group of kids from these communities and the whole hope was that they would learn more about each other and see where it went. Um, we call these online, we call these hangouts, they were online hangouts. And initially we planned to hold about five to 10 with maybe the 12 to 15 students that we had interested in, in, in our program. Uh, here we are six months later, we've held over 200 hangouts with over 50 students from the towns that I've mentioned. And we've not done much in the way of trying to recruit kids. This whole year was, was meant to, uh, as experimentation, as a trial. Um, and we wanted to see, frankly, if it worked. You know, would these kids come together and get along or would it be a disaster? Would it be, you know, Mentos and Coca-Cola? Um, and uh, it, anecdotally, to my eyes as the moderator running every one of these hangouts, it was actually going really well. And I was hearing charming anecdotes of kids you know, without me there, staying up till four in the morning on Zoom until their parents made them go to bed, kids in Louisiana and, and in Wellesley, Massachusetts. Um, I've, I would see them following social media on each other. Um, two of them are dating, which is a whole nother liability thing I need to talk to the lawyers about, but kind of nice. Um, didn't think that would happen. Uh, and, and yet uh, we wanted to see if we could prove that this worked quantitatively. Um, this was after all an experimentation year, we needed to finish our experiment. So, um, it's actually, I'm, I'm very glad to be presenting here today because the survey we submitted to our students is just back. And um, a, a, I'm gonna give you guys a brief snippet of the results that our, that our you know, students came forward with. 97% um, of our kids say they've learned new perspectives from these online hangouts. 90% feel more hopeful for the future of our country. 90% feel more empathetic to perspectives and lifestyles that are different from their own. 97% of our kids are gonna to want to recommend this to, our fr to their friends. 93% of our kids have made what they feel are genuine friendships through these hangouts. And then these are the two that, that you know, really uh, touched me. 100% uh, of our juniors are gonna come back and take part senior year. And 100% of our seniors wanna somehow stay involved with the program. Um, it's touching for a teacher to have that kind of response from students 
touching for a guy starting a nonprofit to have free labor from your seniors as well. So um, wanting to stay involved. Um, so, I, you know, I felt like like Dr. Frankenstein, it is alive. This works. This is great. Let's do it. Um, and while the COVID-19 crisis has forced us to cancel this summer trip, our seniors were going to go live with each other this summer. Um, the kids from the north were going to go to Lake Charles, Kilgore, Texas, Longview, Texas, and Catula, Texas, and live down there. And then the kids from the south were going to come north. Um, we had lots of interest from journalists and documentarians about creating content on this exchange. Um, and unfortunately, we've had to scrap all of that. But, you know, Aaron said it really well. This is, can also be a time of opportunity and possibility. And one thing I've learned about organizations is that if you can find what's good about what you're doing and stay on the field when everyone else is rushing to the sidelines, you might find open lanes for yourself. Um, and we've definitely found that. So what we're doing now is trying to build off of the success that we've had this year and sort of uh, build up our model and scale. And so the model moving forward, and this is based on a lot of reviews from students, conversations, um, bringing in <laughs> furloughed consultant friends uh, who now have time to, to uh, work for a nonprofit, um, is, is we're structuring organizations somewhat like a university. So for our online program, kids can sign up. Um, they will get paired in a, in a class of 50 kids from all over the United States, and they will also get placed in an advisory group of eight. Um, Aaron, you talked about it a lot, mentorship, having adults who've made it are really important for kids today, especially for kids from communities who, who aren't always surrounded by that. Um, so we are bringing in mentors. Um, we had special guests come in and give talks and our kids said it was great to talk to these celebrities, but I didn't get to know them. I'd like to get to know them. Um, so these are advisory groups that would meet for a half an hour, eight kids from all over the United States with, a, with an adult who's had an interesting career and you check in, you get to know each other, you cultivate the kind of relationships that we like to see. Um, we're moving forward with that. This summer, we're scaling the program. Um, we're building up the model and scaling it out with the hope of one day having what, we're, what will be a club. Uh, we're going to make the American Exchange Project a club like the Model UN or the American Red Cross uh, in every high school in the country. Because, uh, you know, to be an informed citizen, you can watch the news. You can also go out and see America and meet the good people living there. Um, I realize the theme tonight is positive forces in a troubling time. And, um, I can tell by the faces that probably none of you are in high school, so my program might not be something you guys can be a part of. Um, but I think what I've seen in my little world, my, my 50 kids from the opposite poles of the United States, uh, is a lot of hope for uh, a country in a really difficult time. Um, we, we see every day we're reminded that our nation is fractured. But we, what I've seen bringing kids from totally different backgrounds together is that ironically, there's much more that unites us than divides us. And we have at the end of the day, what all our kids are realizing now, which is much more in common than we think. And if we approach our conversations, all conversations, but especially those with people very different from us, not just with open ears and open hearts, but with genuine curiosity, um, with, with, a, with, an, with an affection, a common affection, a brotherly love for the person sitting across from you, um, then that actually cultivates the kind of environment in which our democracy can thrive. Um, and that's what I've seen this year. We've just sort of put the capstone on the trial year, packaged it, um, and we're looking to sell it really starting next week. We've got our first uh, cohort of incoming students from outside the areas in which we've been working on Monday. Um, so we'll see if this plane can fly. <laughs> Stay tuned, one and all, and thank you very much for having me. That's, that's my presentation. David, thank you. Wonderful. And incredibly inspiring to see someone, again, from the younger generation taking a leadership and visionary role. So, again, hat tip to you. Our next speaker, Frank Raphael, is, we go way back. Frank was actually at the very first YANA meeting in January 2011 on the snowy night. Uh, Frank has an aversion for stairs. He actually took the stairs up to the 18th floor. He was so dedicated. He's been nothing but inspirational ever since. He's gonna talk about COFEED, which is his for-profit but mission-driven enterprise, which gives three to 10% of gross revenues to charity, to local charities. Frank, it's all yours. Thank you, Ken, and thank you everyone for uh, coming to the meeting. It's so nice to see so many familiar and friendly faces, even the ones that aren't familiar or friendly looking. So thank you so much. 
Uh, and Aaron, great to see you, good friends, uh, uh, giving some nice presentations. You too, David. And, you know, sorry you don't think we look like we're in high school. I beg to differ, a few of us, but, you know, a little bit. Um, you know, it, it was um, – my journey with Yana has been pretty tremendous. You know, I, um, I was uh, in between um, going into my third career. You know, I graduated Yale uh, 25 years ago. Actually, this weekend was my 25-year reunion, which we did via Zoom, which was incredible, actually. Uh, it was great to reconnect with a lot of people. Uh, I can't believe it was 25 years ago. You know, my first career out of college, I worked for um, Mayor Giuliani, uh, senior advisor on parks. And I learned about the parks, learned a lot about the government. I'm a proud New Yorker, grew up in Brooklyn and Queens. I'm in Manhattan right now. I uh, love the city. I uh, left that job after a period of time to make some money because, you know, like a lot of us, didn't really have any money. And I wanted to support my family after my father died. Didn't know re really where people made money. Uh, you know, no one really taught me that at Yale uh, or at high school. You know, no one ever said that money was important. But, but I finally realized that money is important. And it was a sort of a rude awakening. But I had one friend from Yale who was working on Wall Street had, you know, very unsure ideas what Wall Street was and what it did. Uh, it was super nebulous in my mind, but I knew that people there probably made money. They wore nice suits, so they were probably doing something right. Uh, so I went to him. I said, listen, I want to make some money. Uh, he got me an interview. The guy hired me, uh, the hedge fund that I worked in for the next 15 years. The multi-billionaire hired me for no other reason. The only reason was because I went to Yale. That was it. Um, he, he knew I knew nothing about Wall Street. He knew I was a bit of a math guy. A science guy, but um, he took a chance on me, and I I wound up becoming the uh, the main trader and uh, running the trading floor uh, for this fund, a very successful fund. And it was a great career. I did it for 15 years, almost 15 years. Um, after uh, doing it for a period of time, uh, there was a really traumatic thing happened. Not too traumatic. I, mean, I lived through 9/11 and things like that. Real traumatic as far as uh, the world going through, similar to right now. Um, and that was you know the Great Recession they call it. Um, when, you know, a lot of businesses went sort of under big unemployment, similar to now. Um, and there was a really uh, disruptive uh, uh, sort of mindset in America. And I knew that I wanted to sort of like change careers for no other reason other than I knew that in America, there was time, there was a time of, of great opportunity, much like right now. I mean, now the, the opportunity is much, a much higher magnitude than even then. But I knew that if I was ever going to start my own business, that was going to be the time. And I also knew that, you know, seeing what happened with Occupy Wall Street, how Wall Street was really vilified, which I thought unrightfully so, quite honestly. Um, and there was a real disconnect. It was a totally polarized America, much like now. Um, and there were really, you know, there were people literally protesting um, downtown Manhattan, for those that remember this, you know, a little more than 10 years ago. So I, I knew that, you know, there's something wrong with, uh, I guess, the capital system, capitalism, even though I'm a proud capitalist. And I wanted to start a business that combined, I guess, capitalism with nonprofit work. And I wanted to create something that would make an impact. I had no idea what this meant. I knew I wanted to do it. I had some money, thankfully, from my Wall Street career. And I knew I had enough to start a business. I didn't know, really know where that was going to go. Uh, initially, I thought maybe create a socially uh, a progressive hedge fund, which I am doing right now, actually. Um, but I didn't really know. So I camped out at the Yale Club a little more than 10 years ago. And I just started brainstorming different ideas. Started, you know, asking people to meet me for lunch, have drinks. And really just had a big, like, sort of data dump. And I, um, you know, I sort of settled on this idea to start this restaurant, one restaurant, one cafe that was going to be much like Ken had said, um, you know, a for-profit model. And I wasn't even sure if I was going to be for-profit, actually. I didn't even know whether for-profit or non-profit. But I decided for-profit made more sense just because it's easier to scale. You know, businesses, well, even non-profit doesn't mean no profit. You know, you need, you need money in anything to make money, whether it's government, for-profit, non-profit, church, religion, everything. I mean, unfortunately or fortunately, in America, you know, money is... Um, the current money is what we use to, uh, you know, is a game, is a game that we play. And unless you have a business that is viable economically, you don't have a business. It doesn't matter if it's a nonprofit or not, or for, or for profit. In any event, I was uh, really working on this business plan, uh, going through investors and going through the whole thing. And while I was sitting at the Yale Club Library, I sort of little noticed that tonight there was going to be a meeting with this, uh, I'm not sure if it was even called Yana at the, at the time. I think it was simply just a, a little blurb. I don't think Yana wasn't even in the name yet. You know, it was, are you looking to make an impact? Are you a Yaley looking to make an impact in the world? And I was like, yeah, sure. I like impact. I'm a Yaley. I'll, I'll try it. So I did go up. I walked up to the 18th floor. Thankfully, I started a fourth library, so it wasn't a full walk. And I saw Ken, and it was a few of us in the room. And that started, you know, pretty much um, an amazing journey with Yana that I've had over that, growing my business um, and watching Yana grow. And, you know, Yana has grown because of the leadership of so many amazing people. Great board. We obviously have a great executive director right now, which was sort of great for us for the last two years we didn't have one. And thank you, Rachel, for all the work you're doing. It's really been amazing. 
Um, and it's really, you know, being, being around a lot of like-minded people in a for-profit, non-profit, doesn't matter, that wanted to make an impact was uh, a great place to be. It was really a great launching pad for me to start my own business. And, you know, really the biggest sort of benefit for me uh, in Yana was not, was, was the people obviously, but really Ken in particular, you know, seeing Ken run the business and see how he ran Yana, um, I've used a lot of the lessons that in his management style in my own business because my business has grown pretty, uh, pretty quickly. And we, we've opened a bunch of places and, you know, I've always had Yana to lean on. Uh, though I'm no longer on the board, I always uh, get a lot of pleasure seeing what has happened with Yana and how it continues to grow. It's still, you know, 10 years old, still in the infancy, but it's, it's going strong. So, you know, during Yana, I started my company, Coffee, that's Ken's side, opened up one little cafe in Northern Boulevard in Long Island City, Queens, with this nonprofit, for-profit sort of hybrid model. And one shop grew to over 20 shops, opened up over 20 restaurants around the city. And they all shared this model. You know, some of them are beer gardens, some of them are pure cafes, some of them, you know, similar to Starbucks. I don't like saying the S word, but similar to them. A uh, bunch of restaurants uh, also. And, you know, a lot of them have a different concept as far as food and beverage, what we serve. Uh, but the one thing we don't vacillate from is our charitable core, which is th uh, three to 10% of gross revenue, gross sales to local charitable partners. Uh, the way it's sort of evolved and I was an evolutionary uh, biology guy at Yale, so that was my sort of focus. So I like the idea of evolving. I like the idea, I think uh, I think David has said uh, pivot. Uh, I like the idea of pivoting. It's very important in any business to pivot. So I was very comfortable with pivoting. But the one thing we have not pivoted from with Coffee is the idea that we have this really strong charitable uh, mission. And it's been really great. And what we've learned through this whole thing is that uh, supporting local charities, whether it's through direct contribution, which we do, or our job training program, we work with the New York family, uh, teaching you know young kids who are aging out of foster care, um, get jobs. We have all uh, baked goods or bake with the assistance of adults with autism through a program. Uh, all that you know, it, whether it's that uh, you know on hand uh, job training portion of it or the money, we find that the give back has completely supported our business. Um, we would not have grown as quickly as we have if it weren't for this charitable uh, component. And I'm really fortunate to have had, now obviously I'm not the guy, you know, lots of businesses that do this a heck of a lot better than I do, but I saw that the movement was happening in America that, you know, it was pretty clear actually because I was living right by Occupy Wall Street, pretty clear to see people like wanting to burn down the stock exchange that there was something wrong with capitalism, you know, it was pretty clear. So I was, I was pretty fortunate to be, to be able to see that and to sort of use that for, um, for a charitable uh, business model that has proven to be uh, pretty um, successful, thankfully. Right now, what I see in, in America, um, interestingly, is the same thing, you know, that I saw then over 10 years ago, um, except by a factor of 10. Um, you know, it's, it's this, it's the Great Recession um, on steroids. And I don't mean that in a bad way. I mean that in a really great way, actually. Um, I've never seen more opportunity for people who want to start businesses um, or want to start new uh, disruptive technologies, whatever they may be. Um, and it's really, you know, not sure what, what, what they can be. They can really run the gamut from anything, but the opportunity is there. I mean, as, as we're in this uh, scenario where, uh, you know, nonprofits don't have money to fund their mission anymore, or where uh, almost every retail store is on the precipice of not reopening, where every corporate entity is not sure where the liquidity uh, to keep their ongoing business will happen. Um, you know, whether you're employed in nonprofit or for-profit, you know, we're in a situation right now, which is hidden sometimes by a bunch of the governmental stimulus that we see, but we're in a situation where a very large chunk of America, uh, you know, over 20% uh, are currently unemployed. And who knows where that's gonna fall when the economy starts to reopen. And I'm not sure, but what I do know is that during these crazy times, um, regardless of the reason, obviously, you know, whether they're crazy times, I've seen, I guess, a few of them, you know, 9-11 was a big one. Like I said, the Great Recession was a big one. This one is by far the biggest. One thing I do know, uh, pretty sure, sure, I, pretty sure I know this, uh, is that there will be amazing businesses, amazing businesses, uh, revolutionary businesses that will be born out of this, um, you know, great reset, as people have been calling it, or the great awakening, or whatever way, whatever way you want to put it. Um, there are going to be some, some, some entities that come out of this thing that are really gonna change the way, not only commerce, not only business, not only the way that businesses are, are um, currently structured, but you know, there's, there's a real problem with the idea of business in general. You know, I mean, during, during the Great Recession the first time, 
there was a lot of challenge with people understanding, like when Occupy Wall Street, you know, corporate welfare about, you know, all these corporations being bailed out and, you know, too big to fail and the whole thing. Well, it's, 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 the, same, it's the same playbook right now, uh, except it's the play, same playbook in many more industries. So we're in this very weird situation in, in America where, yes, it's crazy polarized, no doubt about it. I'm, gr I'm very grateful that there are great, uh, thoughtful people like David, you know, trying to, trying to bridge that gap a little bit and really amazing people like Aaron who are trying to get these kids from underprivileged places into great institutions like Yale and elsewhere. It's really awesome. Uh, but, it's clear, but it's clear that, you know, we need a lot more Aaron's and David's and Ken's and Rachel's in order to make this whole thing successful in America. And I'm not sure exactly, I mean, obviously, I don't know where, how this book is going to end, but what I do know is that there will be a lot of change going through that. So, you know, what that essentially means, why, why, why I'm super excited about it, is that I see some of these um, businesses, you know, a couple of businesses, obviously, you know, in a very small scale that were born out of the Great Recession, you know, Uber and uh, Airbnb and, you know, I don't want to say WeWork, actually, I've got a bad one right now. But, you know, there are, a lot, there are a lot of great businesses that were born out of this thing. I think this time, though, we have the potential to really change the landscape of business. And I think there'll be some really interesting technologies that come out because of that. Um, you know, there's a big, there's a big uh, you know, polarization right now, but there's a big push one way or the other and like online voting versus not online voting and uh, big polarization between mail-in voting and not mail-in voting. You know, one thing for sure is that things are obviously going the digital way, obviously. I mean, we're talking on Zoom, you know, on a Wednesday night. Clearly, that's the way the world is going. Um, but I think, you know, we may be in a landscape right now that for those people that really do want to make massive disruption in the world, whether it's, you know, you know, like I say, blowing up the two-party system, which probably does cause a lot of polarization. It's not my thing. You know, I, I'm, I'm not going to be the guy that does that. But, you know, there, there is a lot of opportunity right now to really bridge the gap and create business models and nonprofit or for-profit, doesn't matter, that are going to provide opportunity for all Americans um, right now and all New Yorkers right now. Um, I've seen the power of it from Coffee. And like I say, I'm, I'm really proud that we grew Coffee to a, to a bigger company, but we're still a peanut in the world stage, you know. But, but I see, though, in our little microcosm that the world is ripe for this whole, uh, you know, unification of for-profit and non-profit. And you see it. For-profit businesses are forced to be more non-profit, right? They even, even, not even, not J.P. Morgan, but J.P. Morgan, Goldman Sachs, you'll see their employees going around cleaning parks. They wear their T-shirts showing that they're doing this really proudly. Um, you know, you'll see them do that. And you'll see them give to charities. You'll, it becomes a big part of the corporate ethos. They don't do that necessarily because they are good people, which they are. They do that because it's good business right now. And in order to attract really great employees, they want to work for a company that serves some sort of social good. So for-profits are changing into this more nonprofit model to some level. And conversely, same deal with nonprofits. You know, whether, whether you're, you know, the Robin Hood Foundation or uh, Bloomberg, Bloomberg or Philanthropies, you know, these nonprofits are forcing their recipients of their money uh, to use it more so than just the dollar that they gave. So when these, when these nonprofits give and these big foundations give, you know, $100 to a nonprofit, whatever the number is, they want 100x return, 100 plus x return, doesn't matter what it is. They want more than a $100 return, which essentially means that you want to, they, they want to invest in nonprofits that create a return on their investments, which is not, here's $100, the old model was obviously, here's $100, if you're lucky, you take out 10% of that for administration, if you're lucky, and then if you have a good guide, guide star rating, that's good. <clears throat> and then you use the next 90% of the money, or 90 bucks in this case, for a social mission. Well, these great groups threw that out the window. Now, for the 100 bottles, you need 100 more. I think that trend is going to continue in a really strong way. And I think, um, you know, groups like this, like what Yana has been doing for over a decade at this point, or about a decade at this point, and will do for the next, you know, century plus, um, you know, a lot of really great, ideas are going to be born out of this whole mission that are, are going to make an impact, um, that are going to be impactful for society. So I'm really curious to see how that's going to play out. And I hope that if there are people that were thinking about starting something, it doesn't matter how crazy it is right now. Now is absolutely the time to do it. This is a societal shift. This is a once in a generation, I think, opportunity we're going to have right now. I mean, I'm, as I sit here in New York City, New York City is not even open yet. And we're close to being open, but not open yet. Um, it's good. It's still time. And these things have a hangover. It's not just, you know, it's not an on-off switch and all of a sudden things are back the way they were. But things will change. And I think right now is the time uh, to, you know, maybe you don't want to start a, a new business, but work for one that is doing something. If you want to, work for one that is going to start something and do something that's really going to be transformative. So I'm looking forward to it. 
I'm super excited uh, for my uh, for my business, just where I'm looking to go through. And I'll just I'll be very brief in this thing, which is my mindset in this is that I mentioned the evolutionary biology thing. Uh, God bless you, David. The evolutionary biology thing. What I did in uh, what I studied. Um, what we learned there, we learned that, that things do evolve, right? And obviously, I think at this point, everyone probably except for my mother believes in evolution at this point. Uh, so evolution is a very, very important thing. But what I learned and what I studied, very, uh, what I liked actually, and I thought I was going to focus my life on, was this idea of evolution that, that is called, for those that know, don't know it, it's called punctuated equilibrium. And it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a form of Darwinism, but not exactly. There's actually a, a whole Darwinist group of evolutionary biologists that are, that are sort of against the punctuated equilibrium people. But they're, they're one and the same. But what the punctuated equilibrium people say is that uh, there is basically in, 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 in any species, there's massive nothing. There's a mass, massive nothing. Nothing happens. It's, they call it stasis. Nothing happens. But all of a sudden, some external event or exogenous shock, as they call it in the, in the biological term they use for that, some exogenous shock happens, and that shock forces change. And the example they always give for that, you have a fish pond, and you have, like, fam is a fish. They're swimming around, doing a great thing. All of a sudden, the fish pond gets polluted for whatever reason. Could be from a meteor. Could be because of a toxic, you know, corporation. doesn't matter. The fish pond gets polluted, and only 2% of the fish survive. And they survive because they have some sort of adaptation, that allow, a pre-existing adaptation, by the way, that allowed them to survive. So what happens is those genes get propagated to the next, next, next. That's where we are right now. We just had this crazy exogenous shock happen. Uh, this virus happened. You know, and I don't want to take the virus in it, but I know the virus is a political thing at this point. It doesn't matter whether it's uh, caused by the government shutdown or caused by the virus shutdown. It means nothing for my mindset. The fact is that all these businesses are shut down and people are in this shift right now. They're thinking what the next part of their life is going to be. And that's the opportunity for us right now. Because as these businesses are closed, the new business with this functional equilibrium theory that is able to survive in this um, environment will be the businesses that are going to be able to scale worldwide. And I think it's going to be um, absolutely one of, the, one of the largest opportunities to go out there. What I'm doing in my world for that is from a coffee standpoint, um, I was planning on doing this for a long time, but I've, I've exacerbated it because of this, is I'm creating a sister company uh, called Glow, G-L-O-W, which is all plant-based, all vegan. Um, I'm, a, I'm a crazy vegan. I'm a proud vegan. I'm, I'm plant-based, and I love it, except my restaurants are not vegan, which makes me a really bad vegan, I guess, in a lot of ways. So I serve a lot of people non-vegan food. But I believe very strongly that a vegan is a way to go. I mean, for my own reasons, it's, it's a personal thing. From a business standpoint, though, I see the vegan trend exploding. And obviously, you know, you see like Beyond Meats, public company, Impossible, you know, for those people that tried it. But the people out there, you know, David's age, sorry to keep on poking at you, David, but David's age and the next generation, or my kid's age, you know, it's becoming more commonplace for whatever reason. So I know from my own personal standpoint, I want to be in, 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 in the mix. So I'm creating this new brand that is all plant-based that I'm looking forward to scaling it. I'm going to get a little aggressive with it. I think now's the time to do it. So I'm going to open a bunch of them right now. I'm opening six of them in the next 12 months and see what happens and see really where it grows. As my side business, as we mentioned, uh, you know, my initial thought with this whole uh, disruptive thing I was going to do, I was going to create this nonprofit hedge fund. Uh, because that's what I like. I like the markets. And I understand the markets. Um, so I, I am creating one. I'm partnering with a group called Get Focused, which is a pre-existing nonprofit group. This guy, Golden Martinez, amazing guy, really great rock star partnering with him, and we're launching actually on Monday, uh, June 1st, we're launching something called the Focus Fund, uh, and the Focus Fund is going to be exactly uh, similar to what he does with Get Focus, which basically uh, gets kids from the inner city and empowers them through nutrition, uh, literacy, and uh, fitness. Uh, very, he's a very motivational guy. Uh, we're doing all that, and we're, we're bringing it to the financial spot, and we're going to really teach a lot of these kids uh, financial opportunities and, you know, have a, have a training program for jobs out there that uh, they may not have had the opportunity to have. Um, and I'm excited to do it. Sorry, I spoke for longer than I was supposed to, uh, but I'm just really excited for the opportunity. And, and thank you for um, everyone here. I know everyone on this call and beyond makes a really big impact, and I'm excited to see uh, what you guys do next. So thank you. Okay, Frank. Frank, thank you. A lot of provocative ideas, a lot of inspiration as always. Thank you so much. Okay, our next speaker is Bettina Jean-Louis. She's with the Harlem Children's Zone, and she's the Senior Managing Director there, and she's got a really exciting update. Bettina. 
Hello, good evening, everybody. Hope everybody is doing well. Uh, my name is Bettina jean louis as um, Ken just stated. I am with the Harlem Children's Zone. I have been there for 18 years now, and I head up the research and evaluation capacity. So when I found out 18 years ago that there was a community-based organization that had a really good reputation in the community that had been doing good work, but that was really looking to um, experience explosive growth that had this theory of change where they were going to work in a focused area in central Harlem that was going to grow to 97 black areas, the 97 black area, and that they were going to uh, provide everything to the young people in that area. So there would be a pipeline of programs that would work with their parents, that would work with the young people, that eventually grew to include after school programs for K to 12, um, charter schools, um, and also focus uh, staff members in the local public school who were providing support, uh, that we would have an uh, anti-obesity program and an asthma program and all of the different services that children who were growing up in a community that had so many deficits in different places where intervention was needed, that this organization would create best practice programs at every single stage of a kid's life and that um, all of that work would be, would be grounded in community building work uh, where we would um, bring in the adults in the community, the parents, the business owners, the faith-based community and help them to work with us to create a place where kids could thrive and grow and where the whole organization could change uh, and it became a place that kids wouldn't want to escape from. So it wasn't just we would serve a few dozen kids. Uh, I, I, I don't mean to say that pejoratively, but before we felt that we had been serving a, a small number of kids and those kids would be successful and then they would move on and they would leave the community. And we wanted to create an initiative that would change the whole community so that even as kids would become successful and we would do it at scale, they would want to stay in that community and invest in that community raise their kids in that community, and that would really be the way to uh, change intergenerational poverty within the community. So it was a bold idea, and it was an organization that was not afraid of change, and it was not afraid of looking at data. Um, and so there was a few things that were part of the ethos of the organization. So one was that there would be best practice programs at every stage of a child's life, um, another one would be that there would be community building. That's really important part of what we do. Another important aspect was that there would be a culture of accountability and data so that the organization would be unflinching about looking at data. Um, we would eventually grow to have me and another 13 uh, members of the research and evaluation team uh, and database team who would work in concert with uh, about 1,800 uh, practitioners and educators who are doing the work, who want to learn from data and infuse what's being learned um, from the data that we're looking at, that we're analyzing into program, that we would have continuing conversations about um, what are we seeing about children's literacy, what are we seeing about asthma rates, are kids missing fewer days of um, school due to asthma as a result of the asthma intervention that we had created, um, and we would then infuse what we had learned into continuously improving our programs, uh, building evidence, and then getting to the place where we were able to show that we had been successful. And it was important for us to show success because, A, we wanted to make sure that our programs continue to be flying, continue to get better as we grew from serving a few dozen kids to serving thousands of kids. So in a given year, we serve from 13,000 to 14,000 kids. So when you have that kind of scale, which is bigger than a lot of school districts in some cities, you have to make sure that you have systems in place, you have an infrastructure so that you can really understand what's happening with your children. So because we were going, going to grow so quickly and on such a massive scale, we had to have great data systems. And also because we were going to grow so quickly and so massively, we needed to make sure that we would be able to fundraise. And the data story was part of that as well. Uh, and so that was why I was brought on and the team was built out. 
So we have had really great success. I'll just share a few of the data points with you. Um, we had a random assignment study of our charter schools and the kids in our charter schools who were accepted into our charter schools uh, were shown to be ahead of those who did not, um, who lost the lottery uh, in terms of their um, performance on state tests and to whether they took the regents, whether they passed the regents, uh, whether they enrolled in college, uh, whether they were incarcerated, whether they, uh, the girls um, became pregnant before finishing high school. So there are a number of measures where we were able to show definitively that uh, the combination of our charter schools and the wraparound services that were provided by the Harlem Children's Zone really uh, created an advantage in these children's lives. We also did a random assignment study of our anti-obesity effort. We created this program called Healthy Harlem. We worked with Mathematica. We were able to show that the kids who uh, received our intervention, who exercised regularly, who received nutrition services, who did goal setting one-on-one -on -one with adults uh, in our community, that those kids were able to um, improve their BMI and that they were able to get fitter than the kids who did not engage in these activities. Uh, and then we also have a lot of data for our early childhood programs, for example, where we see that our kids are school ready. Are school ready. We bring in outside psychologists who do pre and post tests at the beginning and end of the year. Um, there's a lot of data that we collect, uh, which is why we have uh, so many evaluators who are um, looking at our data constantly. So I did want to spend some time uh, talking about our response to COVID. Um, I mean, I could go on for quite a bit of time about the data that we've collected. I would uh, point you to the Harlem Children's Zone website, hcz.org. If you wanted to learn more, you can always reach out to me. Uh, but with the advent of the COVID, uh, we, like others, were playing this game of trying to determine you know, how, when should we stop having program in school? Um, should we do it ahead of the um, chancellor making a decision or the governor making a decision? Uh, and we decided to wait, but we did start training our staff um, and for our charter schools, um, making sure that all of the kids had computers that they were able to bring home, laptops, and that they would have access to uh, Wi-Fi so that they would um, be able to do their work. And then we trained the teachers and the kids in utilizing um, the platforms that we're utilizing now so that they can um, you know, continue instruction and that there would be zero learning loss. For the kids in our after school, we also were very committed to making sure that they had the possibility of participating in after school. So about 80% of the kids, of the 14,000 or so kids who participate in our programs, uh, do not go to our charter school. So they go to over 300 schools all across New York, and we are not able to um, take control of their school day, but we wanted to make sure that they had the after-school option so that if they wanted to um, come and engage in meditation or if they wanted to uh, engage in a workshop or a nutrition session, uh, that they would have the capacity to do that and that there would be one place where they knew people, they had engaged with um, other kids, uh, a safe place that they could come to. Uh, and we continue to provide that. Um, there's been a bit of a struggle because kids don't necessarily want to be online and after school after having been online for school. Uh, so the attendance is not quite as, as consistent as it had been previously, but we do have the platform. We do have a lot of kids who are coming in and coming out of our system um, as it makes sense for them. In addition to that, we also did a survey of our community. We surveyed 3,300 individuals, uh, and we were able to determine that one in 10 had a COVID-related health emergency, that 26% had a food shortage in their home, 57% um, had a loss in jobs or income within their household. 44% uh, had a cash shortage. And so we used that information to determine that we needed to create an emergency fund for our community. Uh, and we have created a, a, an emergency fund that we're still building up. 
of um, many millions of dollars and we have created a process so that our participants can reach out to us and tell us uh, if they are having an issue with you know, paying a particular bill, if that's something that we could provide support with, uh, and then a decision is made about what uh, cash uh, support can be provided to our participants. In addition, we are very aware that a lot of our community members are experiencing um, a lot of health issues and mental health issues uh, and have our health and wellness team providing stress management groups for parents and stress management groups for young people. We have grief groups as well because we are aware that a lot of members of our community have um, one family member or more or friend who have passed away as a result of this pandemic. Uh, we also have live virtual meditation. So we are very much aware that people are um, processing this and dealing with this in different ways and that there is an undue burden in our community in Harlem and that we have to be responsive to that. Uh, the last thing that I'll talk about that ATC is doing is really uh, being front and center in terms of communicating to our community. Um, so there's a hashtag Stay Covered at Harlem uh, PSA uh, that we have been engaged in. Also have been communicating to foundations and to others about the needs of communities like Harlem. Uh, we have been communicating with other community-based organizations and figuring out how we can all work together to ensure that our community's needs are, are met. They're slightly different, but so similar in, in different ways. Um, and continuing to um, engage in thinking about how community-based organizations could be at the forefront in terms of representing the interests of their communities and helping them to get through this pandemic. So I'm actually coming to the, the end of my tenure at HCZ. Um, I have one more month left with the organization. Um, I know that they are continuing to do great work and that um, I will stay connected with them and um, move on to doing good work um, elsewhere. So happy to have the opportunity to talk with you about HCZ today. Tina, thank you. Just incredibly inspirational. Wish we could have a whole program just on Harlem Children's Zone. What you and Jeffrey Canada have done is just really amazing. Okay, now before we get to Jeannie, and we got to get to Jeannie because I know she's got a busy night. We want to hear from Grace Jin, who's one of our three Dwight Hall Fellows. She's going to give us just a brief update on, on, on what she's doing. It, it involves PPE, but it's incredibly inspiring. Grace? Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Grace. I'm a member of Berkeley College, and I actually graduated from Yale last Monday online, which is pretty wild. Um, thanks so much for having me and for making my summer fellowship possible. Um, yeah, it was so inspiring to hear about all of your work and the resilience in each of your communities. Um, and I will be sharing a little bit about my work with Get Us PPE. Um, so Get Us PPE is a volunteer-driven coalition founded by ER doctors on the front lines of COVID-19. Um, to address the nationwide shortage of personal protective equipment, which is the life-saving masks, N95s, gloves, and gowns that healthcare workers need to stay safe. Um, so I myself, I'm pre-med and a global affairs major, so I'm very interested in the policy and the structural impacts that kind of lead to um, these health disparities and national shortages in general. Um, so the organization started as a Twitter hashtag, actually, and it was a petition advocating for the Defense Production Act. Um, so we put out a simple online form where health, health workers could request PPE where they needed it. And within a few weeks, there were over 7,000 requests. And this just goes to show how dire the shortage was. Um, and today, Get Us PPE has built the largest database of PPE demand across the country and helped deliver over 1.5 million items of PPE. And the most astounding part is that the nonprofit is driven by a network of volunteers, and it's a, about 200 volunteers and local partners um, working tirelessly on a Slack channel, um, as well as on the ground. Um, and our team includes physicians, software engineers, manufacturers, students, activists, writers, artists, who truly demonstrate the power of collective action in this time of crisis. Um, so I joined Get Us PPE because in the early days of the pandemic, um, I really wanted to work as an EMT, but um, Yale sent all the students home, so I couldn't, like, I don't want to bring the virus to my parents or anything like that, so I just looked for remote work that I could do online. 
Um, and after, you know, crying for a few days with my graduating senior friends about losing our senior spring, I just felt like I need to do something about this crisis. I can't just be home and feel powerless. Um, and in March, I signed the Get Me PPE petition written by one of my professors at Yale, and a project manager reached out um, asking me to help start their blog for the organization, and I've been volunteering since then. Um, in the past few weeks, I've written and helped coordinate about three to four articles per week, manage a team of around 10 writers and editors, um, and learned so many new things from like how to use WordPress and SEO strategies to what supply chain logistics are, um, all the while working completely remotely on a Slack channel. Um, and, and lastly, just since we all need some good news right now, I'll just share some of the success stories and achievements I've been able to feature on the blog. Um, so first and foremost, Gaddis PPE is working to get protective gear in the hands of our essential health workers. And recently, through a partnership with Amazon and Boston Scientific, we delivered over 1 million um, face shields to health facilities across the country. And working with Protect Native Elders, which is a group, um, one of our partners groups, we were able to deliver PPE to the Navajo Nation and five other tribal nations facing severe shortages. And um, one of our blog team members actually interviewed a tribal leader on challenges they face on the on the reservation and um, he had a heart-wrenching story but really really affirms the importance of equity in reaching these marginalized communities that are hardest hit by the pandemic and um, as we move forward um, really yeah like focus on the health disparities. Um, we also have some celebrity partnerships that are pretty exciting so the Ellen Show donated $20,000 to get us PPE in honor of a doctor that recovered recently and we also partnered with Close Up 360 um, which we have a, a series called Hoopers Meet Heroes, where NBA basketball players interview doctors and nurses, and we, you can watch this on YouTube um, and also read about it on our blog. Um, and we also just feature volunteers as well, including makers, people producing PPE, um, the medical students who, one of them also a Yale grad, um, who recently published our data in The Lancet, which is a premier medical journal um, and really, really establishes our role as a data-driven evidence-based solution leader in this crisis. Um, and lastly, something I got really excited about, our co-founder, Dr. Megan Ranney, um, last week she testified in front of Congress to shed light on the ongoing PPE shortage crisis, um, to really push for government action as more states reopen and the need for PPE is only going to grow. Um, yeah, so thank you so much for your support that's enabling my work to um, work full time this summer for Get Us PPE as a blog team lead. And I'll just be keep writing um, and establishing thought leadership, pushing for policy action. And you can check it out at getusppe.org um, to follow my work. And yeah, um, and just in these few weeks, I've really seen the power of grassroots activism and just communities rising up and taking care of each other. And yeah, thank you so much for being part of that community. Grace, that's beautiful. You know, we're proud to have you as one of our Dwight Hall fellows. So thank you so much. Just a classic example of making lemonade out of lemons. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Okay, now we've got Jeannie Blaustein, who's the founder of Reimagine End of Life. I've been to a couple of the workshops and the events that she sponsored. Nothing has ever been more inspirational. I don't want to say anything more. Jeannie, take it away. Hi, Ken, and hi, everybody. Wow, what a night of inspiration. Thank you so much for having me and for sharing all your incredible, beautiful work with, with all of us tonight. Um, so I will say just quickly by, by, um, by uh, background that I am a, I guess, uh, let's see, Rachel, can we have the first slide? In one sec. Yeah. Um, so we'll, we're getting that together. Um, I'm um, I am a clinical psychologist by, um, by training, um, and I also have a second doctorate in pastoral care. Um, and I, that my work, though, is focuses on um, the end of life and grieving, bereavement, and counseling. Um, Rachel, if you want me to switch to mine, I can do that. This looks like it's the other. Ah, uh, okay. Thank thing. You. Should I switch? Yep. Let me just okay. share mine. That's okay, no worries, hold on one sec. You should be able to share yours. Okay, one second. Um, okay, uh, my share screen, okay, here we go. 
Okay, just give me one second to get this into present mode. Um, <clears throat> okay, hold on. Um, sorry, one second. So in any event, I am, um, I founded Reimagine End of Life three years ago. Um, and I did that because I grew up in a family where uh, nobody talked about death. And um, I was working in end of life. I was working in advanced care planning. And I heard that um, there was going to be a festival in San Francisco in 2016 focusing on um, an end of life. And um, this, just by way of background, there was, uh, there's a design consulting firm, which many of you may be familiar with in San Francisco called IDO. Their creative director, Paul Bennett, has, had gone through a very difficult death of his father. And as a design thinker, thought, wait, maybe we could do this better. You know, as a culture, we don't talk enough about death and dying. Now, granted, this is all pre-COVID, right? This is five years ago. Um, we don't talk enough about this. We go for every intervention, even when the results are not uh, likely to, to be helpful and, in fact, maybe hurtful. How could we do this differently? So they sent out a challenge online. How might we reimagine end of life? And they got back a zillion ideas, everything from let's change the sounds of the ICU machines so that the last thing we hear is not beep, beep beep beep, or how do we put cartoons on buses and get people to name their advanced care agents to help them make decisions at end of life, and et cetera, et cetera. They got back all these ideas. They didn't know what to do with them. They were thinking maybe they would get a design gig out of it. They didn't get that, and they hired a creative director to say, help us figure this out, and he said, well, instead of just naming a prize of who won the challenge, why don't we showcase these around San Francisco as sort of a popcorn festival and see what happens. See if we can start a citywide community conversation. I heard about this on the radio a few weeks before it happened. I said, I got to see this. As I said, I grew up in a home where no one talked about death. And I thought, all right, this is it. I got to see it. So what do we do? So I walked into a room and there were three or 400 people. Half of them were under 40, which also was mind blowing because most under 40 year olds don't talk about death. Um, and the people were laughing and hugging and connecting. And in fact, I walked up to the guy in charge that night who was this creative director who'd been hired by IDEO. And I said, this is awesome. Have you thought of taking this on the road? I'd love to bring this to New York. And in fact, nine months later, we imagined was born as a nonprofit entity in July of 2017. And our purpose, as you see here, is to transform our individual and collective experiences around illness, caregiving, dying, and living fully through the end. So, what do we do that? How do we do that? So we host festivals. We actually host community-driven festivals. We reach out to faith leaders, artists, authors. We work in four sectors, faith and spirituality, the arts, um, healthcare and social services, and the tech and design world. And we reach out to local folks who know their communities best. And we say, what does your community need to have this conversation? Um, and if it's a faith community, they're going to need one kind of leadership if they're, and voice. And if it's a community of color, they're going to need people from their community, not me coming in and saying, this is something that you all should talk about, right? So, so we, have, we have a huge commitment to working um, on the margins. So 60% of our programs are hosted by and for communities on the margins, seniors, uh, LGBTQ, public housing, communities of color, multiple languages, and we try to have as many um, events happening. And now if you're a New Yorker, you know that if you live in Staten Island, I don't know about you uh, folks, but if I live in Staten Island, I'm probably not going to go to a program in the Bronx, right? Like you're going to go where you live. So, so we have programs in New York. We had um, a festival in 2018. We had 350 programs across the city over the course of a week. And over the time since we've been born, we've had over 500 collaborators, collaborators, which means these local leaders who bring their organizations like, you know, I was thinking as you were talking to Tina, oh my God, we could do such great things with Harlem Children's Zone, you know? Um, and even in coffee shops, Frank. So, who, you know, who knows? Like there are all kinds of ways that we collaborate and we've had over 30,000 people attend these events. So people say, you know, nobody wants to talk about death, but the fact of the matter is even pre-COVID, Lots of people were thinking about death and, in fact, do want to talk about it. We were very, getting very excited about some of our impact. Um, this is, again, again pre-COVID last year. A survey results showed that 76% were having new conversations around death. It makes talking about death easier. Their experience at Reimagine events actually urged them to and helped them identify surrogates who could carry out their own end-of-life wishes and have those end-of-life conversations. 
and we were feeling really good about this, but we felt like we, A, could do better, that we could reach more people. At that point, we were only in New York and San Francisco, and also that we needed a more sustainable business model, because we all know nonprofits are um, struggling, but we actually have a business model where almost all of these events are free. So we're not even making money on the events themselves. And if an organization wants to charge, that money goes to the organization, to Harlem Children's Zone, or to the JCC Manhattan, or wherever it is. So we are really making nothing on this beyond donations. So we were thinking about a model. We did six months of strategic planning at the end of 2019 with a wonderful, actually, New Haven firm uh, called Wellspring Consulting, a lot of school of management folks coming out of, into that firm. And um, we came up with a fabulous plan to launch a national reimagine. We had eight or 10 cities lined up with hosts who were ready to, to come on board as hosts. And then this happened. And uh, we were literally prepared to launch our new uh, festival model in June in New York at an in-person festival. And here we are in the middle of COVID. So like all of you who've shared we also, you know, I think this is our favorite new word in this country. We've also pivoted um, to having everything online. And um, I want to share a few things that we've done over the last uh, couple of months with an ex it's just extreme, almost 24-7 effort on the part of our team, which I'm so proud of. I'm the founding board chair, uh, Brad Wolf, who I met that first night and reimagined as the founding executive director. And um, the first thing we did right away was to create a partnership with the Greater Good Science Center at Berkeley and create um, a, a, um, a place for people to gather. So uh, we now have these every Monday. It started out every Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Uh, together is the best place to be. We had a short meditation, a short grounding inspiration by a notable speaker, and then breakout groups. We were one of the first organizations to start these breakout groups, and it gave people such a sense of connection and community. People were coming in from all over the world, meeting people and feeling less isolated in the very early days of social distancing and sheltering in place. We've now had hundreds, thousands of people come to these events. We've launched on Memorial Day just this week a virtual memorialguide.org. Um, Bettina, as you were talking about how many people have lost uh, friends and relatives during this terrible, terrible crisis, we know that, in fact, we can't even gather to be together. We can't have services the way we're used to. So this is actually a free guide online. You can customize the cards and the templates to invite people. It gives you a literally step-by-step -step online of how to host a virtual memorial or ritual for those you love. So you can check that out. It's in a beta version right now, so your feedback is welcome at any time. Um, and then, of course, we did what everyone else is doing. Our festival that was supposed to be in June is now a worldwide virtual festival going running from May 1st to July 9th. Um, July, uh, January 9th was the first recorded um, death in Wuhan. So every month on the 9th, we have a togetherness on the 9th virtual vigil, vigil to remember everyone who's been lost during this um, terrible pandemic. And we come together again with notable um, leaders in the, in the field of wellness and, um, and support. We have timely and topical programming as part of this festival. This is just one example. We know that COVID-19 has decimated uh, uh, communities of color at a much greater rate. And so we have been focusing on the racial issues, the, the class issues, and the ways in which this, um, this virus has exposed some of the many structural issues um, in this country, which were, of course, always there, but are now being exposed to even greater and more, more, um, more anguishing um, um, uh, levels. So this was a program with Dr. Jessica Zitter, who's based in Oakland, who's an emergency care and palliative care physician who thinks a lot about end of life, and Pastor Corey Kennard, based in Detroit, talking about these very issues of racial disparities in our healthcare and how that's playing out during COVID. So these are some of the kinds of things, in addition to music and are all focusing on grief, bereavement, living fully, how do we uh, stay connected to ourselves, to each other, to what makes us human beings in the midst of this terrible, isolating, polarizing uh, crisis. We've even created a little virtual world. If you want to come to our meet and greet hub, um, there's an organization uh, called Topia. That little uh, figure in the middle is actually me. 
um, and I can walk through the garden and if you are there too, you'll have another f color for your figure and we can walk through and see each other on little screens just like we do right now. So it's a way of kind of grounding people. We could go sit by a campfire together and have a chat about an event that we just went to. It's just a way of bringing people into the space in a way that is a little bit fun and connected. And so I guess what I want to say about Reimagine is that um, we are a very collaborative organization. We have worked, um, as I said, with over 500 collaborators over the course of our three years. And um, whether you are uh, see yourself as a collaborator and an event person, or if you are thinking, if you're somebody who thinks wonderfully and creatively about sustainability, especially in this new digital era, um, we'd love to talk to you um, and hear what your ideas are. And um, please, you know, feel free to share any of the resources. Um, I can be reached at this email. And um, we are also, of course, looking for um, financial support and philanthropic support. So if you know folks that are interested in this kind of work, especially at this moment, I will say that we have had, um, you know, as vital as the material needs are at this moment, we've been shocked by the thousands and thousands of people who've been coming to the Reimagine events since May 1st. We are obviously in a digital saturated world right now, but people are coming anyway for this kind of support, for spiritual, communal, art. You know, the opera was so fabulous. I was thinking, oh gosh, we could do something with them. This is a really way to showcase what other people are doing and in a way to bring people together during a really difficult time and to give them a place and a space to feel their losses, to mourn all that we're that we're feeling, and to um, and to really um, try to move forward in a way that is better than before. So I want to say thank you. I know that was a lot of fast talking, but I wanted to just get in the story and say thank you so much. Jeannie, thank you. That was incredible, and I know there are going to be a lot of questions. And thank you for putting up your email so people can get in touch with you. Sure. To all the speakers tonight, you really did a wonderful job. It just shows the depth and the breadth of the Yale community. By the way, I forgot to mention that Jeannie is a Yale parent. Your daughter, Livia, isn't it? That she just graduated as well. Livia so congratulations graduated. to you. Yes, thank you. Yale parent. All right, thanks, everyone. We're going to do this again uh, next. Remember, the last Wednesday of every month. So the next session for our town hall will be June 24th. Have a great evening. Rachel, thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. Good night, everyone. Thank you.